I was speaking to a friend who recalled a vague story in which a man living near Droitwich transmitting station was able to harness power from the 500 kilowatt signal it radiates to power his home. So I set off down a rabbit hole to examine this tale and others to its origins and to see if there's any truth in it. There are various incarnations of this tale that incorporate variations in detail and even involve other transmitting stations. Let's stick with Droitwich for now. The basic story is as follows, and I've pieced it together as an amalgamation of a dozen or so varying claims. The story goes that a man living near a large broadcast antenna was able to save on electricity bills, lighting his home by tapping into the power coming from the transmitter. Droidwich commenced transmissions after a test period on October the 7th 1934. The two 180 ton masts, both 700 feet tall, radiated the signal at 200 kilohertz and the power came from four 750 horsepower English electric L-type diesel engines, each connected to a 470 kilowatt three-phase alternator, producing enough power to supply 5,000 homes. This is when the first murmurings of this tale came about, soon after Troitwich opened, so it's at least 90 years old. There's also talk of local residents using garden aerials to collect enough power to illuminate low-powered light bulbs. Allegedly, the BBC threatened to sue these people for using up their power, however the case never went to court because the residents promised to stop harnessing power instead. Some variations of this tale mention farmers. Farmers near Droitwich began stringing up lengths of wires with fluorescent bulbs attached in order to light up animal shelters and barns. Other anecdotes suggest that a farmer laid out a long aerial which gathered enough energy to light his pig sheds. Some suggest that the BBC found out about this and prosecuted a farmer for stealing their power. Another variant of this tale is that the BBC successfully sued for stealing power. He was milking his cows courtesy of their longwave transmitter. Hours of meticulous research led me to the most concise version of this story. In Droitwich, some years ago, a householder rigged a series of inductors up and harvested minute amounts of RF power from the 500 kilowatt 200 kilohertz signal of the BBC Radio 4 broadcast transmission. The energy recovered was used to charge banks of batteries in order to provide illumination for the whole house. He was prosecuted for theft, but nobody seems to be able to recall who by, whether it was the transmitter operator, not the BBC but a third party, or by civil authorities. He lived in a house on the other side of the road to the transmitter. Some sources claim the amount of power he was collecting wasn't minute at all. While some anecdotes claim he powered his house, others suggest it was just used to heat a greenhouse. Apparently, propagation tests showed holes in the coverage from Droitwich in the direction of the man's house, and so they closed in on him. The story doesn't just involve Droitwich transmitting station, and it doesn't just involve bits of wire and makeshift aerials, but rather carefully crafted pieces of electrical equipment. It was alleged that someone was prosecuted in the 1950s or 1960s for stealing electricity from the Brookmans Park transmitting station in Hertfordshire. The first station on 842kHz at 50kW went into service on the 21st of October 1929. The second on 1148 kHz, initially at 30 kilowatts, followed on March the 9th, 1930. Apparently, a man had erected a resonant antenna on his property and was using it to power part of his house at the end of his garden, which backed onto the transmitter site. It's alleged that engineers noticed a hole in the distribution of RF energy in that direction and were able to close in on him. As for the outcome of this story, well, that's unclear. Some tales would have us believe that during the 1980s, when the BBC transmitters at Daventry were in use at full power, houses close by on the Southbrook estate had fluorescent bulbs installed in the kitchen, and that when they were switched off, they'd stay illuminated due to stray RF. Apparently there wasn't enough power induced to strike the tube to start with, but once struck, there was enough to keep it going. This is a quite different story, and is somewhat plausible. I'll come to this soon. There's also mention of somebody harnessing power from Ongar Radio Transmitting Station in North Weald. Originally built by Marconi and Cable and Wireless in the 1920s and used to send messages worldwide, it was later transferred to British Telecom in the late 1940s and closed around the 1990s. The vague stories of antennas and equipment were supplemented by the suggestion of men building huge coils on or in their roof space. Someone living in close proximity to the enormous 222 metre tall Crystal Palace transmitter in South London allegedly obtained power from the aerial using a dustbin lid mounted on its roof. 
Apparently, the authorities finally traced and arrested him, but the only offence they could charge him with was not being in possession of a current TV licence. There's also a tale involving a man building a large induction coil on his roof to steal power from Crystal Palace. This story dates back to 1969. One rumour that circulated in naval circles was that somebody living close to the Royal Navy wireless station at Rugby assembled an enormous induction coil in his roof that he used to power his house. He was ultimately caught because communications with the Navy submarines were apparently blacked out over a quarter of the globe. Another tale talks of a man living in Mere Green near Birmingham who was prosecuted for stealing electricity from Crown Castle who used to run the UK's broadcast sites by lining his loft with copper cable and inducing electricity from the television signal, presumably from Sutton Coldfield. I also found a vague story in which a farmer in Wiltshire, or similar, who used to receive a very strong signal from a nearby transmitter that was so strong that he rigged up some circuitry in his cow shed to capture the transmitted signal and power some lighting. The transmitter engineers apparently noticed that there was an unusual dip in the signal level to one side of the transmitter. Eventually the farmer was caught and prosecuted for stealing electricity. This story also pops up in the Shropshire area too. It alleges that a farmer used coils of wire to absorb energy from a neighbouring transmitter and used it to light up the fluorescent tubes in his cow shed so much that the transmitted signal disappeared on that side of the transmitter. And a final tale talks of a village hall located near the former 594kHz transmitter near Frankfurt, Germany, where the electrical field from the transmitter was so strong that the residents only had to wire lamp holders together for the bulbs to light up. I managed to find one reference to back up this story from 1939. It claimed that by using a comparatively simple device, people living near any wire, less a transmitting station, can capture the electrical energy emitted and reconvert it into power for lighting their houses or working the electric iron. The first and only proved case of this kind occurred in Germany. Near Hamburg, electricity bills amongst a colony of market gardeners suddenly dropped to nothing. The supply company was curious, especially when it found that the gardeners still had well-lit homes. An amateur scientist was responsible. He managed to light up an electric torch by captured wireless. He experimented and progressed to lighting three room lamps. It was too good to keep to himself and he passed on his knowledge to the neighbours. After time, engineers at the local radio transmitting station became worried. They couldn't account for a mysterious loss of power. By the time the leakage had been traced and the ringleaders prosecuted and fined, it was estimated that about £6,250 worth of power had been stolen out of the blue. Now, it's important to make some points here. Firstly, I could find no records of any of these cases in the news or any word of court cases involving harnessing electrical power out of the air from a transmitter. I should also point out that I'm not referring to harnessing electrical power from overhead KV lines, something much different that's widely debated on. There's a massive distinction between hearing the signal from a high-powered transmitting station in switched-off electrical devices, speakers or fences, versus harnessing electricity from the air. There's also a clear distinction between lighting a fluorescent bulb and lighting incandescent bulbs with harnessed electricity from a transmitting station. It's relatively easy to use RF and a fluorescent bulb close to the source to light it up. Don't expect the bulb to illuminate at full power though. I'm sure many of you were shown this when you did your amateur radio exams. This wouldn't be something a transmitting station operator would notice because the bulb isn't drawing any usable or noticeable energy. The source impedance is so high you wouldn't be able to pull any sort of useful current and without current there's no useful power to be extracted. A farmer certainly wouldn't be able to power a string of incandescent lights in barns and you certainly wouldn't be able to power your home. All of the medium wave and long wave and even low frequency transmitter sites that crop up in these tales such as Droitwich, Brookmans Park, Rugby and Daventry were designed so that the signals they radiate broadcast to the horizon. The radiation is shaped so that it targets the horizon in order to provide the best possible signal at distance. Of course, enough RF energy is radiated to the area close by in order to deliver a useful signal in that area, but it's minimal compared to the main beam. Most of the people mentioned in these stories live very close to or adjacent to the transmitter sites themselves, and so would be recovering minimal amounts of RF, or at least minimal when we talk about harvesting power. 
RF energy extracted from free spaces usually has low power density since the electrical field power density decreases at a rate of 1 over distance squared. A power amplifier circuit would be required that could produce enough DC energy from the electromagnetic waves to drive a load. If the power consumption of the load is lower than the average power harvested, the electronic devices at the load may work continuously. If the load consumes more energy than the power harvesting circuit can generate, the devices can't work continuously. Experiments have been done very close to extremely high power transmitters by the IBA, in which a small torch bulb was lit by a medium wave station. A half wavelength of wire with a torch bulb connected in the middle was held very close to the transmitting antenna and it did light up. Of course, this is nothing compared to whole houses, barns, strings of lamps and heated greenhouses. In the tales that mention television transmitters such as Crystal Palace and Sutton Coldfield, while they too radiate hundreds of kilowatts of power, they tend to radiate towards the horizon, with the area immediately at the base of the towers receiving less of a signal. To tap into any power, the people mentioned in these stories would have to be right up at the top of the tower, almost touching the television transmitter, and again, the harness power would be absolutely minimal and not capable of the feat spoken about in these tales. In a Mythbusters experiment in 2004, it was claimed that if a box was assembled and connected to a 100 foot antenna, it could power a clock radio. The assembly produced only half a volt, meaning three would be needed to power the display of a digital watch, making it impractical. Any minute amounts of power being harnessed in this way certainly wouldn't be noticed by the transmitting station engineers and wouldn't cause any loss of signal or a null that would disrupt the signal's radiation pattern. As for using a roof mounted coil, I'm not at all educated on these things and I'm nowhere near smart enough to do the calculations, but a copper coil would require an awful lot of turns of expensive copper wire and it would be huge. If anyone's good at physics and calculations, I'd love to hear from you in the comments, but it makes sense that the cost of the coil would outweigh the saving on electricity by far. You can harvest energy from all kinds of ambient sources, but the amount of energy it's possible to harvest from a medium wave, long wave or UHF transmitting station is just far too small to be of any use. You'd have to be extremely close, and even then, you wouldn't be able to power an incandescent bulb or lower your electricity bills. The accounts I mentioned all date back to before the 1990s at least, and there's been no mention of them since. Perhaps they've been jumbled in with the alleged stories of people harnessing electricity from overhead KV lines. Maybe demonstrations of lighting up fluorescent tubes using RF have contributed to these wild stories. As for the different transmitting stations mentioned, it would seem that they were just interchanged between the storytellers to match the area the account was being told in. The fact I could find no record of any of these stories in the news or courts seems to suggest that they're legends of apocryphal tale, and they're simply urban or rural legends. If you've heard any of these stories, then let me know in the comments below.